for, for this is a little surprise for all of you sweethearts in the world. <laughs> we're going to sing to all sweethearts. Sherry Nierman had her surgery this week with regards to her jaw and um, very serious surgery. Um, I do believe things are okay. I think anyhow, she's in Mayo Clinic and, and we want to give her all her all our prayers as well so that healing can be um, uh, strengthening her and that she can um, get well with this surgery. And you had something? Okay, all right, good announcement that Tuesday will be breakfast at 8 o'clock. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, any joys you want to share? Joys? Well, I had 
our joy is that next Sunday, Pastor Stephen and Paul will be joining us and having his first worship service, so we are very excited about that joy. We also um, have had a wonderful time in Sunday school on Sunday mornings with our joyous young ones, so that's been delightful. Any other joys? Well, welcome, and whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at Vine Church. Uh, any other announcements that anyone wants to share? I do have one about Pack the Sack. As you notice, uh, we still have some sacks out in the narthex. Pack the Sack will be continuing through the month of February. Uh, Cheryl and Kate were here on Friday, picked up a whole bunch of good things that have been donated uh, for the Connection Point and took them over to the Connection Point on Friday so people could use them right away. So um, even though it looks like the, the amount there has gotten smaller, we know that we have big hearts and we can share through the rest of this month in February to do what we can to help Connection Point with our donations. Any other announcements at all? Okay, well then, then let us go ahead and join in opening him. I come with joy, page 349. <laughs> sends us into the world to live in love. May we be mindful of the needs of others and open our hearts to God's calling. God will empower us to open our arms to embrace our neighbor's need. And send us into the world of errors of grace, mercy, justice, and love. May the God of wisdom and truth come to us Phillips. May the God of compassion and hope make us faithful to Christ's mission. Let us join in prayer. Gathering God, we give thanks for the vision, adventure, and passion that has brought us together in this holy place. Help us to be open today, grateful to meet Jesus in each other and in our neighbors far and near. Happy to do a new thing. Thankful to be your church together, to do that which by your design cannot be done apart. 
challenge us, inspire us, strengthen us, and renew us. God of grace and wonder be with us in this place. May our worship today strengthen us to do more than we can imagine, that your world might be healed, that your justice might come, and that your hope might be spread. May it be so. Amen. You may be seated. I would love to have the children come forward. Now remember my goodies today, so don't let me forget to give them to you. <laughs> Can you all stand up here on the very top and face the congregation? Because I'm going to share with you something today, and I want you to help me, okay? You're going to have to use your hands, all right? We're going to have to use our hands, all right? So in your lesson today, you learned about the Beatitudes and how those were very special, okay? And we also learned that God is always around us to help us, correct? God's always there. And if, if we have hard times or difficult days, or we have joys that we want, we can always share those thoughts and those feelings with God, right? Absolutely. Okay. So we're going to help the congregation also learn this, all right? We're going to do some sign language. Have you ever done sign language before? Mm -hmm. Do you know what, what sign language is used for? Yes. Yeah. 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 People who, are, um, who have, who have a, a hearing impairment or who are deaf sometimes use signs to tell what they want or what they're thinking with their hands. And so today I'm going to teach you some signs, and then you're going to teach it to the congregation. We're all going to sign a little bit, okay? So the first one I want you to do is I want you to take your hand and I want you to put it up in the sky, like kind of like in that, that window there, and I want you to bring it down here. Just put it up and bring it down. Just one hand. No, one hand right here. That's good. Bring it up. And, you know what? That, that's a sign for God. God. Because God is in the heavens here, looking down on us, and pray to God, right? So God, okay, and then I want you to take your one hand and put it on top of the other, kind of like you've got a plate underneath your hand, and I want you to lift it up like this, and that means help, help, okay, now we're going to put it together, God helps, and now we're going to take our hand like this with these two fingers here, we're going to take them, and we're going to take it on this side, and we're going to move it over here, and that means us. Us. So we're going to say, God helps, helps us. us. Wow. All right? And when we do that, we receive blessings from God. So can you take your hands like you're going to grab something soft, and you bring them to your chest right here? That's receive. We receive, okay? We receive things from God. Can you say that? We receive from God. Absolutely. Okay, let's have the let's have the congregation help us now. You can teach them too. So we're gonna say, God helps us. We receive things from God. Blessings from God. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. I love that. Shall we pray? Okay. And we can put our hands together when we pray. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Okay. And everyone else can repeat after us, can't they? All right, I love it when you're up here doing this with us. Okay, we're going to say, Dear God, Dear God, we love it that you are there for us. We love it that you are there for us. We love it that we can pray to you when we want. We love it that we can pray to you when we want. We know, God, that you care for us. We know, God, that you care for us. And watch over us. And love us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Lovely. And I won't forget this again. Thank you very much for everyone coming up. I appreciate your help today in teaching everyone else a little sign language. Thank you.
scripture reading for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 and 20. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, who he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hope through Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. This is the scripture for today. May we hear the word of God for us. Those wonderful half people of the pews two weeks ago we were talking to the camera and we were speaking to the camera and the slide and the light. I'm grateful for those who are tuned in this morning as well and live streaming the service and grateful for you who are here and grateful for that choir. My goodness, that's fabulous. Brother Perrito, I think, was the where the uh, lead message from that particular medley came from, and thoroughly enjoyed that movie as well. Let's join together in our prayer for the morning. God of power, God of wisdom, God of insight, God of healing, we come to you on this day of worship, seeking your presence, seeking your guidance, seeking direction for ourselves and for our church. Too often comfort ourselves by saying we live in difficult times. Too often we fail to confess that we ourselves make the times difficult. We refuse to see the realities of the world around us because of willfulness, ignorance, fear. We make the world a difficult place to inhabit. Forgive us, Lord, for our intransigence, for our tendency to blame everyone else for our problems. Open our eyes to see our own plight, even as you grant us forgiveness. You have given us resources and abilities. Cause us to acknowledge them and to give us and give us the power and willingness to employ them for good. Open our eyes to the needs of others, not as hopeless problems, but as ways we can touch their lives that you can touch their lives through us. Give us confidence in your presence with us, Lord, and cause us to step out in faith, knowing that you are guiding our journey. We are humbled by your willingness to live beside us. We would have you even closer, Lord. We would have you living within us using our minds to detect your will, our feet to move us where you would have us be in life, and our hands to extend your blessed touch. Be with us in Christ our Lord, and call us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and 
forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us turn to hymn number 91, Wake My Soul. sixth chapter, beginning with verse 17. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd and his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits and all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out of him and healed them all. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward in, is great in heaven, for that is what their faith for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. 
Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry again. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what they what their ancestors did to the false prophets. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I remember the date clearly. It was September 21st, 1995. I remember it because our daughter was married the next day. I had a lot of things on my mind as I was backing out of the driveway. I had too many things on my mind, I guess, and I backed out of the driveway and I backed right into a car that was passing by. Nobody was hurt, so fenders were bent. We were both with the same insurance company, so things got settled with no problem whatsoever. But the incident stuck in my mind, and really it made me do two things. First, I learned to be more careful when I was backing out of our driveway. We had to put it on a pretty busy street. The second thing was the thought that it would be really nice if somehow I could see more clearly what was behind me when I was backing up. And that, in subsequent years, has become possible. Thanks to microprocessors and all of the other electronic goo which we alternately praise and curse, we now have backup cameras in our cars that let you see what's behind you. And they not only let you see what's behind you, but they beep and they squawk if there's something to the right of your backing up car or to the left. We got a new car last year, and it has all of these fancy gizmos in it. Given my increasing age, given my limited vision, given my slightly arthritic neck, I, I consider a backup camera to be a real blessing. We need to see what's around us, and we need to see it clearly. Which, and you're gonna love this segue, Leads us to our gospel lesson for this morning, the sixth chapter of Luke. This is called the Sermon on the Plain, and it has much of the same language as Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is trying to help his audience see more clearly. The implication of the teaching is fairly clear, our position in life, where we are, rich or poor, can affect how we see life. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And we say to ourselves, oh, how's that again? Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry, for you will be filled. Well, we don't really think that being hungry is a blessing. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. None of us really wants to be hated. We don't want to be excluded. We don't want to be reviled. We don't want to be defamed. We don't want any of these things on account of the Son of Man or anybody else for that matter. We are egocentric creatures. So when we hear these words, we of course take them and we attempt to apply them to our own lives immediately. And in all good time, we will do that this morning. But first we've got to understand where Jesus' audience was when he was speaking these words to them. They were poor. Many of them were hungry. As part of the lower classes of that society, no doubt 
there were those who were reviled, reviled by those who were financially better off and socially better off and who maybe were even in positions of authority in that society. As those who had been listening to the words of the Son of Man and taking them to heart, they were no doubt hated and they'd already been excluded from any position in that society, any good position in that society. Understanding this, understanding where Jesus' audience was, makes the woes section, which follows, come together a little more understandable. But woe to you who are rich! You have received your consolation. Woe to you who are filled now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what our ancestors did to the false prophets. Now, when we compare these two sections, we see that things are reversed. Things are reversed from what we would consider to be what we would normally think of as how things are in our world. And in the case of those who are rich, who are well-fed, who are laughing, who have social position, who have perhaps admiration of others, they are not seeing clearly or understanding what life is really like for the poor. And for the they don't just need a backup camera, they need a 360 degree camera so that they can see everything around them in, in all directions. That's pretty much living in our world and living in a world of our own making when we have this kind of restrictive vision when we really don't see clearly. Back in the 1960s, a relative of ours did some really extensive research and put together a Dale genealogy. This person lived out in California. I don't really know anything about him. But after she completed this genealogy, she sent it to all the members of the Dale family she could find, including ours, here in Lincoln. It uh, told us things that we never really knew or imagined about our family. One thing we learned was that the first Dale, whose name was John Dale, actually, came to this continent sometime between 1680 and 1685. Came from Great Britain. The genealogy extends for about 200 pages, so there's all kinds of information, some of which is edifying, some of which, frankly, is horrifying. One of the tales told is that we had relatives living in the 1700s on the eastern shore of the state of Maryland. But a relative in particular, this was the third generation of John Dale, according to who was a slave owner. We know this because we have a copy of this John Dale's will, and it was his will and intent to parcel out his slaves to his children after he died. That's all. That's really awful. Even though slavery was a disturbingly common practice in that time, it's not a pleasant thing to consider that I have, that I have relatives who, who owned other people. So suppose, suppose now for just a moment that the practice of slavery in American history was such that 
my family would decide, my family would decide to take the genealogy and to take the pages of that will of John Dale out of the genealogy. Do that because, well, they would be recognizing how horrible slavery is and they would want to excise this from our family history. The question then is, would ignoring this change our family history? Uh, no. Unfortunately, nothing will. What it would do is allow those of us in succeeding generations to sort of sanitize our family history. It would let us think of our ancestors if they were much better people, perhaps, than they were actually were. We would be creating a kind of mythical past for our family, a narrative about a narrative about who our family was rather than who they really were. It would be a refusal to see clearly who our family was. I think my own family history when I hear the current discussion about critical race theory, if not taking a truthful look at American history means taking a scrub brush to those aspects of our American history that we don't like, that make us look bad, then we are creating a mythical past. We are creating a past in which our relatives appear to be much more righteous and holy than they actually were. This sermon on the plane, we are told, occurred and people were able to somehow draw strength from Jesus and they were healed. The blind included, I would suppose. Jesus was really in this sermon opening eyes opening eyes to those who might think more highly of themselves than they ought. Although we may not recognize it, we may not admit it, or much think about it, a good many of us who are worshiping here today are really truly privileged people. We are, if not rich, at least comfortably well off, Probably none of us has ever really been hungry. We tend for the most part to enjoy life and we have those things to laugh about in our lives. Some of us have had enviable positions in the world. Some of us at least were not thought of poorly by those who are around us. Those in our circle consider us be fortunate. To look at our lives clearly, to see clearly who we are and how we approach life, that requires better vision. We need to take the scales from our eyes. And while recognizing these things, we need to see more clearly that others around us have not shared the privileged lives that we have. In our world, there are those who are poor. In our world, there are those who are hungry. In our world, there are those who are not thought highly of, to no reason, to no action of their own. There's another aspect to Jesus' words here in Luke 6. The people we have to remember in Calvary, looking for good news, looking for something good. God sees all things clearly. In just a few years, it's been really interesting to me that the last few years, to note on our 
television newscasts, how we're seeing things better than we used to. It may be a sporting event, it may have something to do with a, an ecological event, it may have something to do with a disaster like a forest fire or an avalanche or a train wreck. But suddenly, cameras now that are filming our news are not just ground level cameras. Suddenly, we're getting a bird's eye view of whatever this event happens to be. And the reason is, even local TV stations have got drones that have cameras attached. And they can put those up and they can give us a much better view of what's going on in this particular instance that's fairly clear. These are nifty little devices, it seems to me. When a Nebraska reporter is doing a report on a prairie fire, for example, it's not just the prairie burning coming toward us, we get the view over the top and see how widespread it actually is. Luke's message, in a way, is not really hard to understand. He describes Jesus opening the eyes of his audience by giving them truths. Truths which, if they're willing to accept them, will give them a much better view of the world they live in. It also gives us a view and give, gave them a view of what we might call God's bias. God's bias. After opening his audience's eyes by reversing the painful reality of poverty, of hunger, and of social rejection, he then says in verse 23, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. Now, absorbing this scripture, may not be really quite as simple as it first appears. It's not that poverty, after all, or hunger, or being reviled are really good things, things we ought to go out and seek and ascribe to in some way. Instead, it is opening us to the reality that God, God who is, after all, in some sense, biased, is seeking to open our eyes and focus our vision where the vision needs to be focused. There are problems in this world and we can do something about them. If we have eyes to see and ears to hear, we can do something about the conditions around us. Resources available. It begins, of course, with a willingness to help, a willingness to help, followed by a willingness to view and to understand the world in this 360 degree view, in this over the top view, this world as it really is. It begins with a willingness to follow those things with our financial resources. Those powers or resources, whatever they are, that we can muster, both as individuals and as churches. We can help. We can help. There's bags out in the garden, so I really good way to start. Our scripture this morning reads, and all the crowd were trying to touch him. For power came out from him and healed all of them. Power came out from him and healed all of them. We can be the power of God. Our energy, our strength, our minds, our hearts, these are the powers that God wants to put to use. 
but to put our advantages and our strengths to use. God needs us. God will use us if we are only willing to let God open our eyes. And if we are willing to let God cause us to step into the world and feel and do his will. Let's pray. Precious God, we have strength, we have power. We need the willingness. We need the courage to step forward, to do your will in this world for you. In Christ's name. Let us stand as we sing, I am pressing on the upward way.